Thank you all so much for coming. You have choices, and I appreciate you coming here for today's session. This is a really special day. As many of you know, I'm Dr. Janie Heath. I'm the Dean of the College of Nursing here at the University of Kentucky. We are thrilled to see such a wonderful outpour of support for our Nursing Leadership Lecture Series. In particular, we would like to thank our partners, our clinical partners, who I hope make it back safely from the Magnet Conference down in Orlando, uh, Florida. We understand they're all trying to get out right now, so um, let's keep them in our thoughts and prayers. But there are many, many other nursing colleagues that I would like to thank for joining us, besides our UK healthcare clinician faculty, our friends, our students, our alumni. We have a real wide circle of so many who support the good work that we do here at the University of Kentucky, whether it's academic or service, the work we do for nursing is just the best. And then we have military colleagues that are here that I would like to thank. In particular, we've got Colonel Krupp that's here, all of our fabulous military students that are here, undergraduate as well as our graduate nursing students. This is a special day because we've got our very own distinguished alum who has served our military for almost over 30 years now. So it is a very, very special day. You know, I think about 15 years ago, 15 years ago, September, remember what happened, 9-11? Remember that? And here we are today, and we're going to hear a story from someone who's lived through that experience and many, many others, and all of these lessons that she's learned throughout her, her fabulous nursing career. So once again, on behalf of Dr. Colleen Schwartz and all of our colleagues, we're thrilled to have our very own nursing alum, PhD alum, Colonel Marla DeYoung. And she's not only here to bring us her words of wisdom about her leadership journey, but she's also going to be with us to celebrate our homecoming this week. So let me tell you a little bit about Colonel Marla DeYoung. She's the Interim Associate Dean for Research and Director of the Faye Glenn Abdella Center for Military and Federal Health Research, Professor and Senior Air Force Advisor at the Daniel K. Inouye Graduate School of Nursing. You ready for this? Uniform Services University of the Health Sciences. We fondly refer to that as USIS in Bethesda, Maryland. Colonel DeYoung has shaped military and civilian nursing clinical practice, the delivery of health care, nursing education, management, research, and health policy. She's had a 27-plus year that's been stellar in the Air Force, where she has held numerous leadership positions and has been recognized through early promotions to the ranks, starting out as a lieutenant all the way to a full colonel. Colonel DeYoung is a past dean of the United States Air Force School of Aerospace Medicine at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Ohio. She's also been the executive director of the Tri-Service Nursing Research Program at USIS. In addition, she earned her BSN from Grandview College in Des Moines, Iowa in 1998. Shortly thereafter, she was commissioned as a second lieutenant in the United States Air Force and began an active duty service in 1989. She went on to earn her MSN, Trauma Critical Care, and that's actually how I first got to know Marla through our professional home with the American Association of Critical Care Nurses. She earned that shock trauma MSN degree at the University of Maryland in, in Baltimore, and that was in 1996. Her PhD was right here from the College of Nursing, and she completed that in 2005, studying cardiovascular health, and she continues to work with many of our nurse researchers right here at the University of Kentucky, and many of those rich heart researchers are here with us today that are involved in Dr. Deborah Mosier and Dr. Terry Lenny's work. From December 2006 to December 2007, Colonel DeYoung deployed to Baghdad, and while she was there, she was the the uh, program manager for the Joint Theater Trauma System, and she managed data for over 9,000 combat casualties, managed a trauma registry, wrote the first air transport policy, and many more. 
As program manager for the Department of Defense Blast Injury, Injury Research Program, she developed a database to inform Congress of research collaboration among seven federal agencies to identify urgent funding priorities. She informed clinical practice and closed research gaps by conducting funded research studies regarding military in route care, prevention of hypothermia, the effectiveness of buccal pulse oximetry, adherence to prescribed diet and medications, and linkages between anxiety and outcomes for patients with heart failure. Colonel DeYoung has published, I mean, she is a scholar, she's a prolific writer, almost over 50 journal articles, nine book chapters, and she is also a member of eight professional organizations where she has served on national committees, developed practice standards, and more. I think we did pretty good with her, getting her started. Colonel DeYoung is the recipient of multiple awards, including the American Association of Critical Care Nurses Flame of Excellence Award, the Carolyn Williams, and there's Dr. Williams back in the back, award from the University of Kentucky for Excellence in Doctoral um, uh, Education, she is also the recipient of the Air Force Field Grad Nurse of the Year Award and the Joint Service Commendation Medal. Colonel DeYoung was inducted into the University of Kentucky College of Nursing Hall of Fame in 2011, and then the ultimate happened. She was inducted as a fellow in the American Academy of Nursing. Let's welcome <laughs> Colonel DeYoung. Good afternoon. It is a joy to be here. Dr. Heath, friends, colleagues, faculty members, mentors, really, really good to be back in Lexington this week, and, and I really appreciate the, the warm welcome and look forward to sharing with you some of the things that have kept me busy over the last uh, 27 plus years that I've served in the United States Air Force. Whoa, that went way. Can we back out of that? Because there you go. Perfect, okay. So um, I was asked to talk about advancing nursing science through leadership and knowledge. I have served in the military for a long time, and so that's the world that I know. So a lot of what I share with you will be from that perspective. But I also want to share with you some things that you all have been doing to really summarize and highlight how there are a lot of parallels for how that works. I have nothing to declare other than I am proud and honored to serve our nation, and I am happy to be here. So when we think about knowledge and science and leadership, I first consider the mission. And I know for the military folks in the room, you hear mission all the time. And for the civilians in the room, you might say mission, that sounds sort of stuffy. But really, that's what it's all about. And as I was talking today, even with some of you in the various leadership forums, the mission drives everything, right? The mission tells us where do we invest our energy, what are our priorities, where in the space of time have we been, and do we need to go? And so for me, this is really, really important. Having served in a variety of executive leadership and education and research roles, you know, my first questions really are, what is job number one, and what can I do in my way to contribute to that? And so it was interesting that Dr. Heath even mentioned, I would just remind us that we as a country just remembered the 15 year anniversary of 9-11. What were you doing that day? What did your clinical practice look like? What clinical practice guidelines were in effect 15 years ago for your patient population? What kind of research were you doing? How much funding did you have? Those sorts of things I think are important. And I can tell you that from a military perspective, certainly our world changed dramatically on 9-11 and absolutely shifted the research and clinical practice kinds of priorities that we face. So in the military system, 
These folks up front could answer this question. What is job number one? In military medicine, it's to maintain the highest level of patient care that we can provide anywhere in the world and to support that warfighter so that we can achieve whatever the military objective is it's that, that's before us. And so it's been a tremendous privilege to be involved in that mission and to help that evolve and, and change over time. And I'll share something um, about that. So from a military perspective, we prepare a medically ready force. And I won't read everything on the slide, but when you think about those bullets on the slide, that's what we are responsible to do. Ideally, we would prevent injury and prevent illness, and then we wouldn't have combat casualties to care for in the first place. But we are interested in things like having an in-route care and an evacuation plan ready to go for those individuals who do need that care. We certainly are interested in advanced trauma resuscitation so that when we have folks who are wounded seriously, that we have a good plan that can work in any environment no matter how austere, no matter whether on the ground, on the sea, in the air, that this is something that will work for us. And so our goals in meeting all of these um, topic areas as well is to make sure, to the extent possible, that we're performing all of this using the evidence. And so I know many of you are in school and you're taking classes or you've taken um, classes in the past, and these things we don't do because it sounds right. We want to make sure that to the fullest extent possible, it's evidence-based. And certainly we are a very unique system and, and really unlike any other healthcare system in the world when you think about the kinds of things that we're responsible for. So as a leader, when you're thinking about this, what are some of the, the things that we can do in terms of a military um, mission to, pro to, to produce this capability for our, our um, military members? So first, to promote wellness. And you probably know in the military environment, we have a very strong emphasis on wellness, on physical fitness, on taking care of oneself physically, spiritually, mentally, psychologically, um, because that makes for folks who are effective doing that military mission. So health and fit force is certainly important. We want to bolster fighting ability. So what does that mean? In today's world, that has a lot to do with topics such as human performance or nutrition or those sorts of things. Um, there's a lot of work um, in the research world, for example, uh, load-bearing systems so that soldiers who are hiking up the mountains of Afghanistan with 80 pounds on their back have some sort of assist device that might make that 80 pounds seem less heavy those sorts of things. Delivering the right care at the right time at the right place, I'm gonna talk more about that, but it has to do with lay down of medical assets. That next bullet, you might be surprised, but our goal is to achieve zero preventable deaths. Now the key word there too is preventable because we know that unfortunately in the nature of war there are some combat kinds of situations that are not survivable brings us back to the last slide, are doing all that we can to prevent those sorts of injuries through body armor and vehicles that are resistant to blasts and those sorts of things. But zero preventable deaths is absolutely our goal. Every American should have the best possible chance not only to survive that injury, but to achieve the best functional outcome that's possible after injury. We want to reduce combat-related mortality, whether that's infections or whether that's post-traumatic stress or coagulopathy or hypothermia or any of those sorts of things that we know um, our combat casualties um, are at risk for. Maximize that functional recovery. And then we also have a military mission to complete. So this makes us unique in the sense that we might have a situation where we have medical demands to meet. We've got five combat casualties who are severely injured, but the battle must go on. And so how do we evacuate and take care of those patients in a zone that's still hot, where there's, uh, we call it care under fire? How do we do that safely 
to maximize the outcome for our patients, not have our medical individuals hurt in the process, but be able to keep on with that military mission. And certainly, you know, those are extraordinary goals that we're, we're trying to achieve. So when I think about fostering visionary leadership, what does that look like when it comes to nursing science and scholarship? And first, I think we have to understand and interpret what the requirements or the gaps are. So for example, in the current conflicts in Iraq and Afghanistan, medical individuals and professionals were faced with a new challenge. We moved medical care very, very far forward on the battlefield. And what does that mean? What that means is we had medical folks very close to where combat casualties were being injured, and the goal was and is to have someone who requires surgery in the OR in less than 60 minutes after injury. So we do a pretty good job of that, but as you can imagine, that requires quite a laydown of assets. But what we found when we did that is we had a lot of folks who were receiving surgery very soon after they were injured who then needed to be transported to a hub area so that they could then be evacuated out of country. And that was a new mission requirement that we had never had in previous wars. And so we had to adapt to that and we had to think about who's the best clinician to do that? What kind of care requirements do those people need? Fresh out of the OR, perhaps not intubated, perhaps intubated, perhaps on vasoactive medications, perhaps with chest tubes and other invasive monitoring, and they need to take a 25-minute helicopter ride from point A to point B, and what level of care do we provide to that sort of patient? It was new for us. We also have to set our strategic and our tactical priorities. So the other thing that was very different about the current conflicts is we had a goal of having our active duty injured combat casualties out of country and in route or on arrival to Germany in a day, 24 hours. And largely that happened. But that was a completely different system than we had used in some of our previous wars. And so again, different strategic and tactical priorities drive a different skill set, drive different requirements that, that we need to meet. And as leaders, it's exciting to be part of that, to think about how do we find the way to yes, and how do we successfully meet this new mission requirement. So as you can imagine, that requires a lot of innovation. Because again, zero preventable deaths, we want to move patients when they're by no way, shape, or form stable. They're barely stabilizing, and so that's a requirement that, that we were trying to meet. And so we had innovative kinds of uh, solutions. For example, um, you may have heard even in the news of lung rescue teams. So some of our combat casualties had horrific lung injuries, especially when they were very close to blast injuries. And we deployed actually lung teams into theater so that we could move those patients safely and soon back to Germany and then back to the US using a variety of very sophisticated ventilators that we wouldn't normally have in theater. It's just one example of, of how we've approached some of these, these solutions. And all of that takes a certain degree of boldness and intention, because when you think about this from the first time, oftentimes, we're like, there's no way we can do that. You want to do what? You, you know, it, it's challenging, but it requires that sort of leadership and that sort of direction. So for example, the Air Force has launched new teams called TACIT teams, Tactical Critical Care Evacuation Teams. And for the first time, we have active duty military Air Force nurses who are now flying with Army flight medics and Army paramedics to the point of injury where there might be a care under fire type situation and moving patients um, directly off the battlefield into a fixed facility, brand new for Air Force. So there's been a lot of um, things that have evolved in, in that whole patient movement environment along those lines. We've also even deployed, if you will, surgeons further forward. So we have a lot of surgeons and CRNAs deployed with our special forces folks so that they don't necessarily even need to evacuate those casualties right away. They have the supplies and the equipment needed to take care of those patients right where they are and even hold them for 24, 36 hours if necessary, a new phenomenon we call 
prolonged field care, and you might have even read some in, in literature about that. So it's all about uh, persevering. And the other um, piece that I put up here was to consider uh, the potential dividends that one re reaches um, and gains from this sort of innovative system, and I'll talk a little bit more about that as well. The other thing that we have, have done, and, and I'll, I'll get back to that, but I like this quote that I included by a friend of mine, Colonel Susan Dukes. She said, research is not a luxury on the battlefield. It's a quiet obligation we have to our soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines. And so for the first time in recent conflicts, we had researchers conducting IRB-approved human subjects research in theater so that we could answer these questions, so that we could, in fact, provide evidence-based um, medicine when that was called for. The other um, piece that I was talking to some earlier about today, too, was the importance of crafting this vision for where we're going. And I think it's critical that we link to the past and shape the future. So one has to know in the evolution of how a healthcare system works, a military healthcare system works, an educational system works, where have we been and where are we going to go and how are we going to get there? And those are leadership questions that I know many of us uh, ponder at great length to think about what's the best way to move the system forward. But in many cases, that takes a deliberate investment in and commitment to research and performance improvement to make that happen. Because if you're happy with the status quo or you're happy just leaving things the way they always were, you'll be a stagnant organization and then you couldn't really expect any change in outcomes over time either. And so, for example, in, in the process of setting up the um, joint theater trauma system, which I'll talk a little bit more about in a minute, we developed many evidence-based clinical practice guidelines for combat casualty care that then can be adapted into these unpredictable settings. The interesting thing about that, too, as you probably know, is many of those have now been adopted by civilian level one trauma centers and have been used in the um, attacks and incidents and so forth that have occurred within this country. So I think, for example, of the, the Boston Marathon incident. There were many civilians who reacted to those who were hurt. And what was one of the first things they did? Tourniquets. Now, when I joined the Air Force in 1989, tourniquets was a bad word. It was a very bad word. We were taught, do not use tourniquets. Tourniquets cause tissue damage. Tourniquets are the last resort. And now tourniquets, frontline kind of intervention. So you see how things can change over time. And the importance, of course, of emphasizing continual learning so that we keep um, that edge and we keep moving practice forward. And then I think it's important to think about how can we transcend boundaries? In other words, how do we make things better as leaders? So I can tell you with regards to the joint theater trauma system, we had in particular Army and uh, Air Force physicians who really founded what was known as the joint theater trauma system, and they modeled it after a civilian trauma system that they were familiar with in Texas, in particular the San Antonio area, but also with reach to rural Texas. And they said, how can we use what we know from the experience in Texas to the experience that we have in Iraq? Because Iraq is a fairly big country, geographically um, speaking, and so you can't have a hospital or a medic or a physician or a surgeon just anywhere. And early on in the war, the, the laydown of those assets probably wasn't what it needed to be, and the surgical capability and where it was wasn't exactly what they needed to be. And so they formed this whole trauma system that was um, in place initially in Iraq and then over in Afghanistan as well. And I'll show you a, a picture of it in a little bit, but tremendous... Um, growth in the delivery of trauma care that has now um, been imported into the civilian world as a result. For the first time, conducting research on the battlefield. And I can tell you that it was our, an Army nurse who was actually very instrumental in making this happen because 
again, with human subjects protections concerns and agreements that we had to do with the countries where we had our researchers and where we had injured troops, there were lots of things that, that had to be considered about that. And so some people have asked me, they've said, well, I read in the news that the survival for combat casualties in Iraq and Afghanistan was the best that it's ever been in, in a war situation. So haven't we maxed out? Why do we need to do more research? Why, why are we going to all of this effort to set up a trauma system? Well, it goes back to that earlier slide of achieving zero preventable deaths. And we're not there yet. And we believe that we can get there. And we believe that there are still lives that can be saved. And so while we believe that, we're going to invest in this future research and try to find the way to yes. And it was through visionary people who said, we will transcend boundaries. No, we've never done research in theater, but, but we will. And, um, and we did. And they, um, did a total of 16 teams, spent six months either in Iraq or Afghanistan conducting human subjects research about a variety of topics to include hemorrhage, to include uh, traumatic uh, brain injury, um, oxygenation, forward surgical care, um, Phototonics and in a variety of, of topics like that, um, anemia in deployed members, altitude kinds of uh, um, effects of altitude on physiology for folks who were in the mountains and, and those sorts of things. So, excellent, excellent initiative. We have a Department of Defense Trauma Registry that now has thousands of data points in it by which we can use now to analyze those data and decide what are the best practices. And it's that registry, for example, that has transformed how we do blood administration. So early on in the war, we did like we had done for a long time. What would we do if we had someone who was um, in a situation of hemorrhage? A lot of normal saline or a lot of lactated ringers and eventually some packed red blood cells and eventually some plasma and eventually some platelets. And now I can tell you today, if you have a patient with traumatic hemorrhage in Afghanistan, they're gonna get very little, if any, normal saline or lactated ringers. They're gonna get a one-to-one -one packed cells and fresh frozen plasma that's ready to go 24 seven. And you know, it's changed. And if you go to shock trauma in Baltimore, that's how they do it now. And if you go to um, Dade County in Miami, that's how they do it. So these things have been transformative because we've had the data upon which to, to see that we could do better. And then we've created lots of new capability. I mentioned the tactical critical care evacuation teams is, is one example, but there are many, many more examples like that that, that could be mentioned. So I just show this slide because it is a nice uh, picture, and you might have even seen this in some publications, it's a fairly famous uh, slide, if you will. But this shows that the goal that we had in Iraq and Afghanistan, one hospital across the continuum. And so you have someone who is hurt, and depending on their situation, they may go to a battalion aid station, roll one very minimally staffed sort of place, but they won't spend much time there. And they'll be either CASAVAC or medevac out to a forward surgical team that has initial surgical capability to do life-saving surgery, to do damage control resuscitation type surgery. And then in a few hours, they will go to a role three facility. That's, that's um, a facility that has ICU and has radiology and has blood bank and, and has um, surgery and, and recovery and CAT scan and, and quite a bit of capability but not the capability to hold folks here for a long time. And as I mentioned, our goal was to have folks back to Germany in about 24 hours or so after injury. And so um, then moving to, to Germany for maybe a day or two and then back in the US in as few as three days post-surgery for someone who was often hurt very, very badly. But this whole system, as I, as I mentioned, it, it was um, a group of, of physicians and nurses who did a lot of work to put this system into place and refine it over time. And 
and there was a lot of um, open communication even among the different parts of the system with regards to how could we take care of patients better. So there were telephone rounds, if you will, with folks from the U.S., from Germany, from Iraq, Afghanistan, talking about individual patients and their situations and how the system did and taking care of them and if there were any areas for improvement that could be identified. The interesting thing when uh, you think about timing is in Vietnam, it took on average 45 days for a combat casualty to make it back to the U.S., and in Desert Storm, which was in 1990, some of these folks here weren't even born yet, uh, in Desert Storm, it was 10 days. And now in Iraq and Afghanistan, it was generally three days or less. So a big mission requirement in terms of, of patient movement and in route care. And this is just another way to show this diagram bold, responsible practice of battlefield medicine. And, and the the goal is the right patient to the right place at the right time and then getting the right care. And this whole system, as, as you can see, is, <clears throat> is, a, is a loop process by which we're abstracting data from records and from real-time data entry into the registry itself. We're analyzing those data, using that to drive up uh, uh, process improvement, then writing best practice guidelines that are incorporated across that whole continuum of care as the approach for how we deliver trauma care. And today, I believe there's over 30 clinical practice guidelines that are evidence-based and that are in practice within um, mostly um, Afghanistan, but we do still have troops, as you probably know, in Iraq and, and medics there to take care of them as well. And then these are the key components, and I'm not going to read all of these, but the key components to that trauma system that has been so effective. So leadership and communication within and across the continuum of care, integrated pre-hospital levels of care, performance improvement, prevention, education and advocacy research, which includes that data abstraction piece as well as the automation, the analysis of all of those data, and information systems. And of course, the very most important thing is the patient here in the center of all of that, because that's the reason, of course, for, for all of the efforts to make this the best possible system possible. So we, what we also found, though, of course, is there's always this need to produce new knowledge, right? There's always so many unanswered questions, and you answer one question and you generate three more questions, it seems like. And so we have really, in the course of, of recent military operations, worked much more jointly than in any time in the U.S. military history. And when I say jointly, I mean Army, Navy, Air Force, clinicians, line officers, combatants, everybody working together very closely to achieve whatever objective is at hand. And um, I would be remiss if I didn't also remind you, and some of you may fall into this category, of serving in the uh, reserves or the National Guard as well. Because reservists and National Guard members have deployed a lot in the recent operations and have absolutely contributed to the, to the success, um, not only in the clinical mission, but the research mission and in educating active duty reserve and guard members to go downrange and, and, and do this. So thank you if, if any of you are um, serving in those capacities. It's also important to, of course, leverage talent and then fortify relationships. And what we have found is it's been so important as we've tried to solve some of the problems that have faced us to work with individuals from multiple disciplines. So from medicine, of course, but we, we partner with engineers, we partner with folks from public health, we partner with folks who have expertise in physics when it comes to these blast injuries and partnering with folks who have um, experience in, um, in designing protection systems that might prevent these injuries in the first place. So that's really important. 
from an academic perspective, we've partnered with many in terms of conducting this research or linking up with subject matter experts who can help us with this. And we've had a number of folks um, as academic um, uh, specialists who have come and spent a, a week or two weeks with us at military bases to help us think about how we can improve processes as well. From the University of Kentucky, I don't know if you're aware of this, but I do know that there are some National Guard members, for example, who spend part of their time in the emergency department observing care, participating in care, trying to make sure that their skills are sustained and ready for when they may be called to use those. There's work going on within the University of Kentucky about the effects of military suicide on the family, the friends, or the fellow service members of the, of the individual who uh, committed suicide. There's also um, a, a, a Combat to Kentucky initiative that is helping military members reintegrate into society and to seek uh, meaningful employment or advanced education and those sorts of things after they leave the military. And certainly there's the, um, the med uh, vet program that is um, popular within the, the School of Nursing. <laughs> And then the uh, College of Health Sciences is also working with some of our Special Forces members, again, to uh, think about how we can prevent injuries of Special Forces members. In terms of partnering with federal agencies and institutions, partnering a good bit with agencies such as the NIH, with the Food and Drug Administration to think about how we can um, make advancements in drug therapies or, or those sorts of things. Commercial partners, lots of work done in the areas, for example, as prosthetic devices. Um, did you see just yesterday there was a military member who was the first to receive a double arm transplant? And um, the, the, the work that's been done in rehab and regenerative medicine is amazing, using 3D printers to print ears or fingertips or other sorts of things to advance the science for those folks who have been injured and to return them to um, functional uh, capability and so forth. Philanthropic donors have been very valuable. So, for example, uh, the Jonas Foundation, and I believe you have some Jonas scholars here at the College of Nursing as well, and they've done a lot to help us with um, our priorities. And it's always very important to remember that we honor all of our colleagues' contributions and that we recognize them so that they um, are motivated to keep, keep on um, answering those important questions and producing that new knowledge that we need. In terms of inspiring others to act with confidence and integrity, this really comes, as I mentioned earlier, is advancing past the status quo and saying, how can we do this even better? What are the skill sets that people need? What are the knowledge, what knowledge are we lacking? and to really move the whole system forward in advocating for evidence, advocating for funding for research, and that sort of thing. Um, opening uh, doors of opportunity. Uh, when I was in, in many of the jobs that I've been in, I've had opportunities to do any number of, of things that I would never have imagined possible. But there are, for everything that is, is a success, there are other things that one undertakes that, that maybe aren't successful. But we need those folks, and I always try to make it a point myself, to open doors of opportunity and help people find the way to success so that we can solve these problems. And, and as a leader, that's a lot about cultivating honesty, trustworthiness, and transparency, which really leads to, to credibility as well. And I, I just wanted to list, I've got a couple slides here of things that I don't have time, of course, to begin to give you all of the details of these studies. But these are nurse-led research and evidence-based practice projects that have been done within the military system by military nurses. Um, in many cases, um, we have enlisted members and medics who have helped with parts of these studies. And these are representative of, of studies that have gone on um, throughout Army, Navy, and Air Force. But lots of work has been done with regards to resuscitation of casualties with acute hemorrhage. And I was actually able, when I was at Lackland, 
in, after I left UK to help with some of that research and trying to determine what are the endpoints of resuscitation for a patient with hemorrhage. Tough to know because more isn't always better. And we know that we can over-resuscitate patients and that can be just as harmful as under-resuscitating patients. Um, thinking about non-invasive ways to assess hypoperfusion, I was involved in some prevention of hypothermia work and you know, even though during many months of the year in places like Iraq it's very hot, when you put a combat casualty in a helicopter and the doors are open and it's gusty and breezy and they've lost a lot of blood, they can become hypothermic very quickly. And how do we keep them warm with um, ideally something that's very light, that doesn't require power, that is effective, and, and those sorts of things. Um, I did some work with, with um, buccal oximetry monitoring. We had a, a concern among many of our flight nurses about being unable to monitor routine uh, pulse oximeter values during flight for individuals who were edematous or individuals were hypothermic or individuals who were missing limbs or other forms of traditional pulse oximetry monitoring didn't work and yet they were taking care of vended patients. And so they were putting the oximeter on the cheek and they were getting a number. And so many times uh, faculty in the room will smile and they'll say, yes, treat the patient, not the monitor. But we get happy when we see a number on the monitor. And we found out that that actually wasn't a good technique for using um, buccal oximetry. It works okay if someone's normoxic, but once they start to desaturate, it's, it's really not a very good way to measure um, SpO2. Uh, a lot of work being done with hemostatic bandages, primary blast lung injury, traumatic brain injury, of course, women's health in the combat environment. This is a very hot topic. If anyone is interested in women's health, um, you've probably heard in the news, again, transcending boundaries. Women will be able to serve in almost any military role in the near future. So there are military, uh, two, two females who are rangers now, and more um, are, are probably in the, in, the, in the pipeline, and um, other special forces and other types of combatant roles that weren't previously open to women. We have women on submarines, and so what are some of the women's health issues that come along with that? Lots of questions to answer. Battlefield acupuncture has been um, explored a good bit and has had um, some, some success with some of our patients. Other, other topics that I, that I put on here, um, a lot of work being done with complementary and alternative medicine kinds of, of topics, a, a lot of in route care work. And I'm actually doing a study right now where we're looking at how we train our nurses, physicians, flight medics, flight paramedics, to do in route care and what the best use and skill set of those individuals should be as we move patients from the battlefield to say roll one or roll two, roll two to roll three, roll three to, to four and then, and then back home. So lots of, lots of things about that. But it's not only about what you would call traditional um, trauma care. We also have a lot of work going on in terms of behavioral health, um, we have work going on in terms of sleep and diet and nutrition and, and all of those sorts of areas as well. To include the military family, because any military member will tell you that the family support and the, the burden that families um, care, uh, whether it's children or spouses, um, is significant as well. Um, some other topics, de detection of compartment syndrome, use of paralytic agents, oral care. Some of these are basic nursing care, but how do you do oral care with, with someone who's intubated in the back of the helicopter? Do you do oral care? You know, those, those sorts of things. And then there's lots of emphasis on pre-deployment training and the research basis for what's the right dose of pre-deployment training, when, where, how, that sort of thing. Translating knowledge to practice, I think, is always interesting and certainly requires a, a good bit of leadership. 
Um, I don't imagine that you all here in Kentucky have any sacred cows to slay, but we do in the military. And, um, you know, these things happen, right? But we've had some, some great examples. Um, for, for one example is, as you can imagine, a combat casualty who is severely injured has a high nutritional need, correct? Dr. Lenny is shaking his head, the nutrition expert in the room, yes. And so when you re if you think back to the slide that I showed about the long time that patients are being transported, for a long time, just because we'd always been doing it that way, we never fed patients intrally when they were being transported. And that's a lot of hours when you think that you turn off, say, a tube feeding several hours before flight and then during flight, and there's all these stages of flight. And so now we said, why do we do that? And nobody really could come up with it. Of course, there was no evidence um, that we could find published for that sort of thing, but we did some, some work in that area, and we found, yeah, we can feed patients, most patients, safely even during transport. And so they're getting better nutrition earlier on in their recovery. And so that's just one example. Implementing the practice guidelines that I, that I mentioned, um, really accounting for the cognitive, environmental, physiological, and ergonomic demands of the operational environment. So we have work that's ongoing that gets at the human performance factors. So alertness, when do people get tasks saturated? How do they handle multi-task um, environments, the emotions, the mental uh, workload? Um, environmental, of course, hot, cold, altitude, um, wet, cold, dry, all of those sorts of things. Physiological, again, we're thinking about fatigue and stress and sleep, the, the nutritional kinds of things, even for our military members. And then ergonomics, I mentioned the, the, um, the load-bearing systems, protective clothing, those sorts of things are all things that require attention and then transforming that knowledge into practice. And that, of course, oftentimes um, calls upon us to revise policies or military doctrine or, again, change the way we have always been doing things. But, of course, that also leads to a need to conduct future research. So that's a really broad overview of some of the kinds of things that I think show how we use evidence and knowledge and leadership to make those changes. And then, of course, the key question is, is does it make a difference? And I think you can see with these data here on the board that it does. I mean, certainly, we would like to see this number even lower. But when we look at the killed in action rates and the unprecedented survival after injury, we're making progress. And there's been some work um, that's been published about how many of the individuals who died might still be able to survive, and you can read a, a, about that. So we still have some room to go, but um, that 90% uh, survival rate is certainly better than it's been in previous conflicts. Transport time, I already mentioned this a little bit earlier, but the, the phase of moving patients from the battlefield to definitive care is down to about uh, less than 45 minutes in Afghanistan. So that's remarkable transport times, especially there, where the, um, the mountains and so forth actually make it a little bit diffi more difficult to transport patients than in, in Iraq. And then battlefield to the US, again, we're down to two to three days in having many of the, um, the casualties back home. In terms, and then so you could say, well, wow, that's moving really sick patients really fast. What are the outcomes related to that? I can tell you that deaths during evacuation are very, very rare. Um, it's not that it never happens, but probably less than, than five or so. And in a, in a study that Ingalls had done, she looked at transport of 975 critical care patients. So these are patients who are mostly ventilated, very, very, you know, ICU patients, your, your sickest ICU patients with high injury severity scores transported by these critical care teams in route mortality of 0.02% and a 30-day mortality of only 2%. So um, again, I think it goes to show that we have a system that is responsive to the needs of the patients and, and, and doing pretty well. 
when you look at some of um, the other outcomes, our amputation-related mortality, you can see that that's way down since tourniquets were emphasized. So very early in the war, tourniquets weren't emphasized, and not everyone had a tourniquet physically on them. Now, if, you, if you're in theater, you always have a tourniquet, or maybe more than one in some cases, um, on you. And tourniquets are used very early, and you can see the, the difference that that makes in terms of survival. In terms of amputee return to duty rates, we even have individuals who have amputations that have elected, and, and quite frankly, even begged to remain on active duty. And some of those individuals have actually deployed again with, um, with a unit. And so those return to duty rates are, you know, they're not high be, because they've in, um, had a very serious injury. But I think when you see from the 1980s to the rates that we have today, we've, we've made some nice differences. And then when we look at folks who had penetrating brain injuries, so very serious brain injuries, again, as you would expect, the lower the Glasgow Coma score, the the poorer the outcomes, but again, functional independence for folks who had a severe penetrating brain injury, 100% um, if your Glasgow Coma Scale was 12 to 15, 74 if it was 9, 9 to 12. Now what are some of our vaccine challenges? Um, injury prevention is still a high priority. So advances in body armor or advances in vehicle design so that if a vehicle runs over an IED and, and blows up, how can we better still protect individuals who are in those vehicles? So injury prevention is, is huge, not only from catastrophic injuries, but injury prevention, for example, of hearing loss or vision damage or other things that might not be life-threatening injuries but still have um, an impact on one's functional status, quality of life, those sorts of things. Hemorrhage, hemorrhage control, still receiving a lot of attention, especially junctional, truncal, and peripheral extremity hemorrhage. Um, lots of work still going on in that area to include um, ongoing work that's been going on for a long, long time about uh, synthetic blood and uh, cold storage platelet programs, those sorts of things. But if we could control hemorrhage even a little bit better, we would still have lives more that we could save. Upper airway obstruction is another one. Folks who are difficult to intubate or difficult to ventilate, that, that continues to be a challenge. Um, evacuation techniques and infrastructure. So we're wrestling with what's the right level of provider how do we do evacuation under fire? What about prolonged field care when, for whatever reason, because of, of a hot battle environment or whether we're taking care of patients on scene for a longer period of time than, than would be ideal, but how do we do that and what's the right level of clinician? Because when we think about it from a staffing perspective, we, we can't have a surgeon or a CRNA or a critical care nurse or emergency nurse everywhere. So we have to think carefully about how to use those precious resources. Um, if the Surgeon Generals were standing here, uh, they would all tell you that one of their big priorities is sustainment of trauma and readiness skills. So our military hospitals, on an everyday basis, we take care of very few trauma patients. And quite frankly, we don't have a lot of bedded facilities anymore. And so how do we make sure that our folks are ready for whatever they need to do in terms of of taking care of patients and being ready to, to go anywhere at any time and meet those mission requirements. And, uh, and suicide prevention, I mean, I think you've probably heard about this in the news. Um, regrettably, we still have too many um, active duty, reserve, guard, veterans who commit suicide, and it is, a, it is a vexing challenge, and there have been many strategies and approaches that have aimed to to try to reduce this more, but, but we're not there yet, and so more things being tested in, in that area. I just wanted to mention a, a couple things that probably are known to you, um, and I call this so we're closer to home, and I think about some of the things that you all have been involved with, and I think if you look 
at the kinds of phrases on this slide, this is the world that we live in, right? And you can pick any number of these things. And some of these things we hadn't even heard of probably five or 10 years ago, right? So thinking about things like Zika and ISIS and teen pregnancy and the Affordable Care Act and information technology and you can read the list. It's a complex world and we have many, many things to think about. And so when you think about your mission areas, it's about promoting health and well-being. It's about excellence in teaching, service, research, clinical practice, fostering diversity and inclusion, all very laudable goals that then are going to drive your priorities as well. From the UK healthcare side, again, committed to research, education, and, and clinical care, being that information resource to your patients. I had the opportunity to walk around uh, the new medical center just a little bit this afternoon, and there's a patient library, and there are other resources for your patients, and there's this sense of being home here as this is your medical home. This is where you can trust us to provide your health care and advise you on health care. And those sorts of things I think are very appealing to patients. And when you think about the different aspects of, of your strategic plans, where, where do you want to go? Well, promoting academic excellence and growth, strengthening the graduate programs, enhancing faculty and student work and research and so forth, providing um, partnerships with, with partner networks, providing value-based care. All of these things are, are near and dear to you. And um, I think you have at your disposal a lot of power and a lot of resources to do that with expert clinicians, with evidence-based care, with your standardized workflow processes, with re-engineered care, medical documentation, infection control. I got to meet a lot of you who are involved in these different areas. And your outcomes that you're looking for are not zero preventable deaths, but patient survival, same thing, uh, quality of care, safety, efficient care, patient-centeredness. These are unique goals that certainly we share. And when I look at the kinds of things that you're doing, again, nurse-led research and evidence-based practice uh, projects, effects of smoking on restaurant workers and multiple tobacco product use, Dr. Han and her team, Dr. Mosier and her team doing a lot with health disparities, cardiovascular disease risk factors, cognitive impairment due to cardiovascular disease, all those sorts of topics. Farm safety, unique, but it's, it's, it's relevant to your population. So thinking about safety and disease prevention and the mental health needs of, of farm workers. Lots of work going on about health disparities, psychological well-being of women with breast cancer, and um, management of cancer pain, those sorts of things. You have a lot of initiatives going on, such as the Shoulder to Shoulder Global, and I think you know, here you're, you're reaching out to other countries, Ecuador, right? Um, in terms of how do you improve the health and well-being of impoverished and underserved communities. Uh, the BREATHE initiative, I think, is interesting, looking at the radon exposure to individuals who live in eastern Kentucky. We have um, individuals that are still looking at things like trucker health and health disparities and sexual harassment and oppression and domestic violence that some women in that profession experience. Um, healthy pregnancies, prevention of preterm births. Uh, early childhood obesity, lots of programs that many of you are involved with. And then from an evidence-based practice pro uh, process, I think many of you in, in the UK Healthcare Center are involved in some of these um, innovative initiatives, um, looking at reusable EKG leads, restraint reduction, predictors of mammogram screening, and so many more things that, that you are involved with. And I would say, um, like like I asked of the military system, does it make a difference? Well, I think so, because now you have smoke-free restaurants and bars in Lexington, right? And in fact, my understanding is, is that has expanded to 12 counties and 26 cities in Kentucky. And we know the health benefit that we realize when folks either stop smoking or they're not exposed to secondhand smoke. Lots of... Um, 
outcomes in terms of the, the biobehavioral research in self-management and cardiopulmonary disease program, interventions for cardiovascular health, an occupational health um, nurse PhD training program, magnet recognition. Many of you, raise your hand if you were involved in that. Many, raise it high. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, many of you worked very hard to achieve that recognition for excellence in patient care, joint commission, accreditation, lots of expanded roles for nurse scientists, for clinical nurse specialists, for nurse practitioners. When I was over here, walking over here just this afternoon, I spoke to a physician in the hallway and he said, we really value nurse practitioners. We need to hire more of them. Do you have any more? Um, that kind of thing. And so these expanded roles, um, high rankings, um, designations and awards from agencies like the American Heart Association and so forth. And I think these are all very indicative of the fact that you do make a difference and that um, together, collectively, you're improving health and health outcomes for those who you serve. And so together, how do we all um, think about this? I think um, what's interesting is to think, too, um, about where we're going and anticipating the threats of the future. So I put some unique threats here for the Department of Defense, directed energy weapons, sonic weapons, emerging infectious diseases, and how do we transport patients with those? So the military was actually somewhat involved in the and setting some of the policies for transport of the patients with Ebola. So how do you do that um, on fairly short notice? Because you don't have days and weeks to plan for this. You have someone who needs to be transported, and, and how do you make that happen? Um, as I mentioned earlier, integrating women into combat roles, special forces, those sorts of things. We have a lot of work to do with data management and electronic health records in the uh, military system. I think you guys have that down. We're working it. Um, Anti-access aerial denial. This is something that you probably haven't heard of, but this is something that receives a lot of talk within the military circles. So in Iraq and Afghanistan, we had the luxury, quite frankly, of pretty much being able to fly at will. Now, were there occasions when helicopters were shot down with enemy fire? Yes. I mean, regrettably, that happened. But it didn't happen very often, and it actually never happened, to my knowledge, when there were patients being transported. But we're planning for future military operations in environments where we haven't been before, where we have new constraints, where we can't necessarily assume that we have air superiority, and we might not be able to fly at will. We might not be able to go in and pick up casualties by a helicopter or by aircraft, for a couple, three days, and how will we take care of those very severely injured patients in the, in the process? So there's a lot of thought that's going into that, as well as the thought that some of our future operations might be in the Pacific, where flight times and transport times are even much longer than they are from Afghanistan or Iraq to Germany and to the U.S. So lots of work being done with that. Information paralysis is actually something else that is... It's concerning. We have so much information, so many satellites, so much intelligence data, so much medical data, and it's overwhelming really to manage a lot of that and to, to know which to act on and which to ignore and which to, to, um, to proceed on further investigation. So that's something that, that we're also thinking a lot about. On, on the U.S. healthcare system, you know, cost of healthcare is, is always a big issue. Cyber attacks and data breaches, we've had hospitals who have struggled with that. An aging population, um, obesity, hospital errors and infection, epidemics, um, retailization of healthcare, um, the, the business of healthcare receives a lot of attention, the violence that we see around the country on almost a daily basis in one sh form or the other, and the effects of unhealthy behavior, smoking, obesity, sedentary lifestyle, um, opioid use is, and abuse is, of course, receiving a lot of, of attention and so forth. So all of this really um, has to do with the fact that we are in a very complex world 
And I, I really uh, liked the U.S. Army operating concept document that came out in 2014. And it talked about the ability to be ready to operate in a complex, chaotic, and ambiguous environment. And what does complex mean? By definition, it's unknown, it's unknowable, and it's constantly changing. So if you just think about that for a minute, that's pretty amazing, right? <laughs> Here's the goal, to operate in a complex environment. It's unknown, it's unknowable, and it's constantly changing. So that just um, is further impetus for us to, to use our data wisely to prevent data overload, to partner with individuals, um, and to prepare for that uncertain future. And the way that's working in the military, again, is to be more joint, so a lot more combined Army, Navy, Air Force operations, a lot more globally integrated health services, modular and in interoperable medical capabilities, improved performance, and then tailored forces by which there isn't one answer to fit all kinds of problems. And so when we think, for example, about really deploying light, lean, interoperable, small surgical teams that can do surgery almost anywhere. Um, I can tell you, for example, um, in, in Iraq and Afghanistan, I mean, we had very large footprints of hospitals, and, and they were actually pretty nice hospitals, especially as, as time evolved, and we had a lot of services at our, at our uh, fingertips. The, the U.S. Air Force is planning for a situation of where we might not have a hospital anywhere where we are, and the back of the C-17 aircraft will be the emergency department, will be the lab, will be the x-ray department, will be the operating room, will be the recovery area, the ICU, the med surge floor, and, and there won't be a hospital per se at any one place, but we'll take the hospital to where the patient or patients or group of patients are. And as we, when, we, when we think about this future as leaders and as individuals who are interested in, in using evidence, you know, it's important to, to track those trends, to be aware of the digital methods of doing so, to constantly look for those solutions to improve practice to embrace technology to make our life easier and make our work more efficient, to look for examples inside and outside of healthcare, to um, apply our evidence to digital solutions, and always remembering that human touch will and always will be key in relationships with our patients. That's a piece that I don't think we should forget uh, because if we, if we lose that piece, then I think we're missing out on a big part of, of what we do. Certainly we have to sustain our momentum, finding that opportunity within the chaos because you can't organize chaos once you're on the battlefield. Um, and General Schumacher said that, so on the battlefield on, and at, at home. And here within your UK system, you're sustaining the momentum not only in Lexington, um, but in the county and, and statewide across the state. And I think what you really, uh, what we all need to do is think about having this passion for the possible. So using intelligent process automation to help uh, machine, to, to let machines and smart people help us to augment our human capability is going to be something that we'll hear a lot more about. Um, in the military system, we're thinking about physiologic closed loop controlled systems. And what I mean by that is we have some research going on actually up at Cincinnati regarding this topic and um, working in, in concert with manufacturers to create machines that will do a lot of automated adjustments. So for example, in the air medical evacuation environment where you're on a plane and it's dark and there's a lot of vibration and you can't have lights on because you're in a blackout condition and some of those things, and the patient's blood pressure goes down, that that machine will give the patient a bolus of either fluid or blood or a vasopressor temporarily and try to keep that going well. Or up the, the, the oxygen on the ventilator or increase the respiratory rate on the, the ventilator. Those kinds of, of things are, are really important. 
um, changes in, in, in maintaining patient temperature and, and those sorts of things as well. There's also a lot of, of um, thought about military robots and what they could do for us. And you know, this again is sort of transcending boundaries, but could we have a situation where robots could extract casualties from an area that was under fire? Some people think maybe yes. Um, could robots diagnose life-threatening injuries and do a form, if you will, of triage? Some people think that's, that's um, well within reach. Um, could they deliver life-saving interventions? Yes. Um, so in the future, some of the younger uh, folks in the crowd may be doing patient handoffs with a robot instead of another nurse or a physician or, or a technician, and, and this is, is absolutely um, possible. As well as, uh, you know, the, the technology with unmanned aircraft has um, substantially changed over time. And so there is the thought that with the continued development of unmanned aircraft, you could actually move patients with or without a healthcare member on the aircraft with the patient. So if you think about that, you could have an unmanned aircraft transporting a patient with no clinician attached to a closed loop controlled system that maybe for a 20 minute flight between point A and point B that would work out okay. Or maybe at some point we'll have that technology to the point where that could be sustained for an hour flight or an hour ground transport as, as well in, in some sort of land based vehicle. So possibilities are endless. And I think when you think about this idea of passion for the possible, um, rather than, than thinking, well, that will never work, um, who was it, uh, I don't remember, who was it in the what, 50s or 60s who said that they thought there was only a need for like less than 10 computers ever? And now I bet if I said something, every one of you would raise a computer in the form of a smartphone, and you know they're everywhere, right? Our cars are computerized, our phones are computerized, our dishwashers are computerized, everything's computerized. And, and so the, these are people who, with other forms of technology, had that passion for the possible. So I, I've been involved in many of the in initiatives and kinds of things that I've talked about today. I want you to know, though, that in the U.S. military system, there are thousands of individuals in the medical professions alone who are engaged in these sorts of activities. And so there is um, great energy and great passion to make things better. And certainly there are many of us um, involved in these areas. It's been a privilege for me to to be involved not only in clinical care at certain points of my career, but I've been able to be in, involved in conducting research. I, during my deployment, I was able to manage a lot of these data in the trauma registry and use those data to write those clinical practice guidelines and, and hopefully standardize care in a, in a consistent way. And so those sorts of things were very, very rewarding, but it's a team sport. And please, if there's one thing I, I definitely want you to know, this, you know, I, I've had the privilege of working with much of this, but it, many, many people are working these sorts of initiatives. So it's a team sport and a team effort. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Um, take the man and say that we're, we're going to take uh, questions around the corner, okay? Um, okay. Is that all right sure. with you? Sure, yeah. So, um, Marla, welcome home. <laughs> and I love this slide, and we are recorded, um, and I just want everyone to hear it right now. Passion for the possible. We've got probably two more years with <laughs> Colonel DeYoung in the U.S. Air Force, and I want you all just to let her know in that reception line how much you would love for her to come and help us keep doing the excellent work we do here at the University of Kentucky. You've inspired us, you've challenged us, and we really want you to be come back home, your old Kentucky home. Help <laughs> us, help us advance our nursing science to improve our practice. 
So another round of applause for Dr. Martin. I just have a couple more announcements now. I would like to ask everyone who's currently serving in the military, who has served in the military, or who will be serving in the military, to please stand so we can recognize you. Casey, come on, both of you. Come on, students. Come on, Colonel.